Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Kenichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Machaba, Munamuli Wanji, Namaste, Jumbo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so very, very happy and so proud that you are joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Also, please tell your kids' teachers, their librarian, their principal, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Good Pods, Podcast Addict, wherever you get your podcasts. Our guest today is Carmen Tafoya. She is here to celebrate Warrior Girl. Before we invite Carmen into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Since the Baby Came, a sibling's learning to love story told in 16 poems. The delightful picture book written by Kathleen Long Bostrom. This charmful, playful story and verse introduces children to a variety of different poetic forms while walking them through all the twists and turns of welcoming a new baby into the family. Mama is having a baby. Everything's starting to change. God, can you tell me what happened? Life is becoming so strange. Since the Baby Came offers a unique take on a timeless topic. The heartfelt and humorous drama unfolds completely in verse, addressing the full range of emotions a young child experiences when a new baby joins the family. From surprise and confusion to feelings of neglect and jealousy to wholehearted tenderness and affection. You're going to love this book. It's a great gift for a new family. It's a great gift for anyone. Since the baby came, a sibling's learning to love story told in 16 poems. The delightful picture book written by Kathleen Long Bostrom. We also want to take this opportunity to invite all the authors that are listening to the podcast to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Please click on the Authors Click Here button up at the top of the page to find out how you can be a guest here on the podcast. Being a guest is fun. It's easy. It, it doesn't cost a thing, and it gives you the chance in a long-form conversation to tell the world all about your fantastic book. You can also learn about our Certified Great Read program, and you can learn about our monthly promotion program that will celebrate your book here on the podcast through commercials, also sharing messages with our 100,000 plus social media followers and have your book displayed at whatever live event we happen to be at in a given month. In September, we're going to be at the PTO Today Expo in Columbus, Ohio. In November, we are going to be at the PTO Today Expo in Secaucus, New Jersey. And in November, we are going to be at the Literacy for All Conference at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. Discover how you can be a part of all that great promotion at a very affordable price by going to readingwithyourkids.com and clicking on the Authors Click Here button up at the top of the page. Join us right now from San Antonio in the great state of Texas. Our guest is here today to celebrate her middle grade novel in verse. It's called Warrior Girl. Please welcome to the show Carmen Tafoya. Carmen, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm so glad to be with you on this pr wonderful program. I'm delighted to have you here, and I can't wait for you to tell us all about this great middle grade novel. Sure. Well, Warrior Girl is about reclaiming what's yours. You know, reclaiming those lost parts of yourself that still hurt because they leave like an empty space. And reclaiming them in a way that there's joy and celebration and a spirit in your core that just can never be lost. It can never be taken away from you. Um, it's about learning how to build a shield that's very special, a shield that lets some things in but not others. For instance, smiles, friendship, love, warmth, happiness, joy, all of that comes right through the shield and arrives safely in your heart. But other things like dirty looks or mean tricks or lies or insults that people say, 
those things just bounce right off. And our main character in this book is a 12-year-old girl whose grandma helps her deal with some of the tough stuff in life by teaching her to build that shield, a shield that's open to everything good in life and that lets the ugly stuff just bounce back so that you can say, no, thank you. I don't want that in my life. Um, the book is also very much about stress and survival and strength um, and strategies that um, help you ho- help you deal with the big problems in life because life is always full of problems um, and it helps you deal with it in a way that helps the world change around you but also makes you closer to other human beings so your bond gets better. Our, our main character is called Selena Teresa Guerrera Amaya. And she uh, starts school and her name just gets changed and her language gets forbidden and her culture and her history get looked down on. And so she survives a little at a time as she moves around <laughs> from one school district to, to another, one small town to another until when she's about to enter seventh grade, the family decides to move to San Antonio, move in with grandma. And she's very excited about that. She's excited about the school that she's going to go to and everything. And then the night before seventh grade starts, her father gets deported. Oh. And the family is without him. They don't know where he's at. They don't know where he's been taken. They don't hear from him and they're very very worried because this is at a time period when there were a lot of cages set up on the border for people to be locked into who didn't have their papers and her dad has never had his papers he started the process and he's tried two different times but he's never succeeded in actually getting the papers and so um as a result she is just very devastated but she makes three best friends at school and her friends and her grandma and the new teachers that are encouraging her newfound love of writing, um, encourage her and help her deal with it. She's making it through the year. She's, she's, uh, effecting change. She's found herself very committed to social justice issues and she wants to fight for what's right and protect people and be kind. And she's very idealistic and just as we come into the spring of the year, the pandemic hits. And even that contact with her friends and her teachers that were helping her feel stronger um, is now not possible because, first of all, they're out of school for three weeks. And then when school starts up again, it's virtual and she doesn't get to see them or hang out with them. So it's a it's a tough year with a pretty nice ending a very exciting but um but nice ending and it ends uh with her own realization that really nothing can be taken away from her what if they could take all the other stuff away if you could still keep inside you that joy that determination that you're going to celebrate whatever you choose to celebrate and that celebration, uh, that ability to paint or to write or to dance or to sing or to create wonderful things in your imagination, that cannot be taken away from you. And that means that they that it is impossible for others to take everything you own away from you. So it creates a strength in her and a joyousness that helps her resolve a lot of issues. I, I love it. There's, I mean, just listening to your description of the book, there's so much there that families can talk about. And that's why we created the Reading With Your Kids podcast, to encourage families to read with their kids, their kids of all ages. And I think that this is, um, there's certainly a lot there. So first, the, the thing that jumps out at me um so quickly and right off the bat is that intergenerational friendship between um, Selena and her grandmother. Uh, it's so 
though I think that those intergenerational friendships are, are are so underrated, and I don't think they're things that a lot of kids are able to experience here in the United States. Certainly not as many kids as had been in the past. Uh, my relationship with my grandparents was certainly huge in my life. I know my kids. Uh, relationship with their grandparents were really uh, and, and continue to be very big in their life. Uh, so I so I love that right off the bat we're celebrating that that relationship between grandparent and grandchild. I, I think that's so so wonderful and um, a great thing just to, to talk about and talk about our, our grandparents, the older people in our lives. If they're no longer with us, just start those conversations about the people um, that came before us. Yes. And and the grandma is so central in here because she's got a few secrets of her own that come out as she's talking with her, advising her on things. At one point, uh, the little girl is very, very downhearted about stuff that's been happening on the news and stuff that's been happening interpersonally between her and and some of the kids at school, and she's really worried. And the grandma just, you know, comforts her. She helps her heal. Um, she soothes her. She reminds her who she is and what mm-hmm. she has inside and what we have to be thankful for and joyful for in life, which is just so important. But then the grandma just kind of lets slip in this little sigh without really meaning to, oh, I was so hoping that things would have changed more 50 years ago it's been 50 years since we had the chicano movement and the little girl says grandma you were in the chicano movement and there's this realization that her grandma was once a young person facing things that she wanted to change um and then her grandma was once a young teen. And then later she finds a picture in the house of this young girl with her fist in the air and a headband on and long straight hair. And she says, that face looks a little bit familiar. And grandma says, that was me. <laughs> and uh, I think this is what happens a lot when you have the joy of connecting with people that are a different age. One of the mistakes I think that... Um, people uh direct young people to is find somebody just like you and in a world where we really have a need um to appreciate diversity between human beings we need to accept that the person we get the biggest joy out of may not be just like us in what they look like or in what age they are or in where what language they speak and so that uh, emphasis on on the joy of, of diversity means that you can be friends with somebody who's significantly older. And, and she develops a kind of a friendship with some of the teachers, uh, enough to carry on dialogues with them, not not buddy-buddy friend. Yeah. It's a different kind of a friendship, but uh, a respectful uh, interchange and dialogue. And she learns to talk to people of different ages. Uh, including her five-year-old cousin who follows her around like a shadow, which gets kind of irritating until she starts to get her involved in the poetry that she likes to write. And then the little girl insists that she wants to write one too. So, you know, she's she's learning, to, she's 12, and she's learning to get along with 69-year-olds and five-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 20-year-olds. She's learning that the world is made of so many different people of different races, of different cultures, of different languages, of different ages. Um, You know, I I think that's very important um, to show children that they can find friends where they least expect Mm -hmm. those friends to be. Absolutely. And, And I love that your book celebrates these conversations between people of different ages and, and you know, and respectful relationships. Because, I, I mean, that's one of the things that concerns me is that, and, and it probably concerned my parents when I was a kid. You know, it's like this, it, there seems to be such a gap between the ages, between, you know, the grandparents and, and their kids who are now parents and then the grandchildren. It's like... Nobody's talking to each other um, 
And it's wonderful to show that, yeah, those kind of respectful relationships can happen. And when they do happen, they're really beautiful. Yes, I think um, it, it also, she deals, she talks about the different celebrations through the year because her grandma's made her so aware of, uh, of this necessity to celebrate every day. So the grandma will wake up and say, uh, you know, today is, is, is El Dia de San Fulano de Tal, Saint So-and-So. And, you know, Saint So-and-So is just like fill in the blank saint, you know. And uh, today's the day of the mariachi, so let's sing mariachi songs. And today's the day of the chef, let's cook something exotic. Um, but in the process of looking through holidays, she begins to question and analyze the values. For instance, Valentine's Day hits, and they don't have a lot of money. Uh, if they'd had a lot of money, Dad would have been able to pay all the fees that were necessary to get his papers a long time ago, and this would have never happened. But it's a reality that one of the obstacles um, for undocumented people is, you know, being able to pay the fees and take the time off from work and sit in offices for days at a time waiting for things to be processed, et cetera. And um, so she realizes when it's Valentine's Day that there's all these gorgeous, big, shiny red Valentines, and she wishes she could buy some of those great big giant Valentines and give them to her best friends and give them to the teachers she admires so much. And she realizes that the best hearts of all are the hearts that are inside the people that care for you. And that no amount of money, no shiny Valentine card um, is worth as much as the friendships themselves. So she begins to, you know, question uh things and, and, and make her own conclusions about things and say, you know, um, maybe grandma was right with this Mexican saying that she's always telling me, solo lo barato se compra con dinero. Only cheap things can be bought with money. And, you know, the important things can't. So you see her coming to an awareness that it, that it requires reaching out and that maybe because she doesn't have all of the access to some of the technologies that, you know, have everybody in the house having their own cell phone or whatever, she's forced to spend more time with people that she ends up really enjoying mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one of the advantages of, of her economic situation. There are many disadvantages. And then it's not till towards the end of the book that she really develops more awareness of the economic problems that her friends are having, which are much worse than hers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she realized, well, wow, you know, you know, poverty can mean being worried about if you're going to get enough to eat that day. Right. It's not just, I can't buy this and I can't buy that optional things, you know, but she realizes that she always has something to eat mm -hmm. at every meal. Um, and, and that she can't take it for granted that everybody she knows or everybody in school with her has that same situation. So there's an awareness of of poverty mm -hmm. and of the existence of poverty in the middle of abundance, in the middle of, of social abundance, there are people and families that are struggling just to make it. And so she, again, she's very oriented to action and she takes action on that and tries to, even in the small things, share what she has with the, her, her classmate that uh, has a family that's very food insecure. Wouldn't it be wonderful if families reading Warrior Girl together are inspired to have those conversations about poverty and do what your character does, which is to sit down and say, okay, so so how can we help? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic thing. And I think that families can, because a novel in verse is not as, um, it, it's, each chapter is a poem. Mm -hmm. And poems in this book anyway, and in many books, tend to be shorter than typical chapters are, mm -hmm. um, they can take some time to take, you know, one one poem a night or two poems a night in the book and then to talk about it and find out how it applies and what ways it relates to them. Uh, it's, it's really important for children to find out that their parents, too, complained about difficult things or 
didn't have all the things that they wanted, either materially or maybe um, uh, maybe emotionally mm -hmm. uh, in, in their lives or, or in terms of opportunities of different kinds or, or settings. Um, children don't always get a lot of choices. They, mm -hmm. They're subject to the choices that their parents uh, decide. Mm -hmm. So... I think it's a good time for, for parents and children to share that, yeah, that happened to me too. Yeah. Or for parents to ask children, what are things that you've seen that make you feel um, upset that that there's not as much um, fairness in the world? What are the things that you see that are unjust mm -hmm. that you would like to change? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think both, both of them would learn from each other a lot. Both, both generations would learn from each other. Absolutely. The other thing uh, that I think would be a great conversation is just the whole immigration issue. And I think yeah. in your book, it, 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 and no matter what side of the conversation you come down on, one of the things that I think that your book can do is to show people that it is, we're talking about human beings here. Yes. And, um, and again, and, uh, whether you're for immigration or not, for the wall or not, you're talking about people's lives. And, and I, yes. I, the other thing I think um, that we're finding out is that it's a much more complicated issue than should there be a wall or should there not be a wall. You know, there, there, there are places, cities around the country now are experiencing something that folks in Texas have been experiencing for a long time. Um, you know, right. when you suddenly have all these people who come in who don't have a lot and don't have a lot of, of, of education, now suddenly it's like, okay, mm -hmm. we're here, and how can you help us? Um, folks are like, oh, this is when – it's, when it's here on our door, it's, it's real. And, um, and, and again, it's like we're talking mm -hmm. about – human beings and i think that's the one thing that we're, that we're yeah. missing we watch it on the news we're seeing these images but we're not we're not hearing names we're not seeing fellow human beings and i think that that's something that's so very important yes and also one of the things that she struggles with is she's wondering because she has her papers her mother has her papers her grandmother has her papers it's her father who came from you know a different country mm -hmm. Fell in love, married, and um, and had her, and they immediately set to work trying to get his papers straightened out. But they were living in a small town because that was where he could get a job. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, um, you know, something comes up. The car breaks down. The baby needs her shots. There's other financial needs. You know, we need to pay six hundred dollars to file this paper, and we need to give the lawyer nine hundred dollars for this one and and all of that there's there's a history there and all of us have a history all of us are part of the human race and the human race has migrated and migrated and migrated and unless you know you are uh from one particular spot in africa um you're an immigrant if you're on a different continent Mm -hmm. Somebody in your family came from someplace. So in the process of her exploring why is this happening, her father's from Mexico, her mother's from San Antonio, her grandmother's from San Antonio, her grandmother's great, 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 great grandparents are from San Antonio. And she's saying, but grandma, that's not possible. That was back when. And she says, well, they were from here before it was called San Antonio before the Europeans arrived. And so you get a history lesson um, with both of her families sharing indigenous ancestry, but one had the indigenous ancestry south of the river and one had it north of the river. So today that means they have different nationalities. Mm. So I think it's a lesson in history how how um, societies work, um, how we have thousands of years of human history before us, and um, 
And I think we don't always talk about that. I mm-hmm. think it's really important for children to to see that and to be able to talk about it because it also gives them the great blessing of relationship to everyone. When you get down to it really far, everybody's related. We're all connected. And so that's a great joy to mm-hmm. be living in a world that's built of family. Everybody in this world is family. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a that's a message that kind of is planted between the lines um, as she talks with children of different um, different ethnic groups. Um, and at certain points, she gets mad because they don't understand. They have Dia de los Muertos. They're celebrating Dia de los Muertos. And her little friend Heather says, oh, that's just Mexican Halloween. And she gets mad at her. She says, it's not just Mexican Halloween. Uh, but then she she goes and complains to her grandma. And the grandma says, well, you're you're upset about this. So what she thinks must be important to you. And she said, yeah, I guess so. And she says, well, have you explained it to her? You know, if you Mm -hmm. want to do something about it, explain it to her. Don't just complain. And so they invite the little girl over. They have an altar to the dead. The little little girl sees all these ancestors of of, uh, our main character. And she says, you know, can I put my grandpa Macintosh there? Because, you know, he died last year and nobody in my family wants to discuss it because they get very sad when they mention him. Can I, can I put something on your altar for us to remember him there? And she does. And so all of a sudden on Selena Teresa Guerrero's altar is this baseball cap and an orange and something else in a picture of grandpa John Allen McIntosh, you know, <laughs> it's not her grandpa, it's her friend's grandpa. But it's it's a it's a, a story of how relationships happen between people and people that come from different ethnic groups as well. How they begin to build solid bonds, uh, bonds of peace, bonds of 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 collaboration, of community. So I think that's very important for children to learn. Absolutely, that's really really beautiful. Like I said. When we started this conversation, uh, there's so much here that families can talk about, and and I absolutely yes. love it. I, I'm I'm just curious, was there something in particular that inspired this story? Well, it was a whole bunch of things. I grew up in a neighborhood that was considered the worst neighborhood in town. It was in a city that's primarily Mexican. It was the Mexican barrio but it was the poor neighborhood. And so at the schools, uh, Spanish was forbidden. Our names were changed. If you were Jesus, you became Jesse. If you were Alicia, you became Alice. If you were Esperanza, you became Hope. And like in this character, she goes to school being called by the, the family name for her, her middle name, Tere, and it gets changed to Terry. And um, so a lot of kids, it's not just me, I think a lot of uh, Mexican Americans throughout the Southwest, but also um, people who come from a different language or a different culture, will identify a lot with this book because your name is important, your mm-hmm. history is important, your language is important, and and so I I really base this a lot on the experiences that a lot of kids were having. Even when I was growing up, way back when, when my, my kids were growing up, and even today, yep. um, they recognize it, they mm-hmm. identify with it, and 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 even teachers are identifying with it because they're seeing examples of ways to um, bring up topics in a positive way, in a way that includes everybody. Um, so that that kind of was in the back of my mind. Um, when I was writing this book, which was during the pandemic. (laughs) Uh, Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we should tell everybody where they can go to find out more about Warrior Girl and find out more about you. Well, um, you can go online and go to Penguin and look up my name or look up Warrior Girl. The book is coming out September 5th. Um, Or you can look me up at www.carmentafoya.net, excuse me, .com is not my 
site anywhere. It got hacked by someone who lives in Russia, oh, and no. I haven't been able to get it back. So, so dot net, a karma dot net, and um, uh, very soon we're going to be posting a bunch of things. I'm also uh, on Instagram at official Carmen Tafoya, and I'll be posting a lot of uh, little items about me and about the book on Instagram. On Facebook, I'm under Carmen Tafoya Writer. All run together like one word. Awesome. And don't forget, Tafoya's with two L's. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Warrior Girl, a great middle grade novel in verse, written by, I guess, Carmen Tafoya. Carmen, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guests will be sisters, Tyler and Cody Fetter. They'll be here to celebrate. Are you mad at me? That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we're going to start by thanking our guest, Carmen Tafoya. Please be sure to check out Warrior Girl. I also want to thank our sponsor, Since the Baby Came, a sibling's learning to love story told in 16 poems by Kathleen Long Bostrom. And we also want to invite all the authors that are listening to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com, and click on the Authors Click Here button up at the top of the page to find out how we can celebrate your book with the world. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Soji Franklin, and O'Leary. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.